Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IVI and Empower webinar on open data and data sharing. My name is Katie Crowley. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Information Systems at the University of Limerick, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Just some housekeeping, we're recording this webinar for on-demand access, and it will be available on the IVI website. I invite everyone tuned in today to post your questions in the question and answer box, and we will do our best to address these as many of these as possible. Of course, your particip participation doesn't need to be in the form of a question. We're more than happy to take uh, comments on the topics as, as we're discussing them today. So today we're joined by a fantastic panel of experts with extensive experience in open data and data sharing. Our panelists come from um, a, a various backgrounds, academia and industry, with years of experience dealing with the advantages and challenges of data, um, data sharing and open data. Before we move on to hearing from the panelists, for those tuning in to the IVI webinar for the first time, the IVI, our Innovation Value Institute, is a multidisciplinary research institute focused on digital transformation and technology adoption, and it's based in the Maynooth University. Founded in 2006 in collaboration with Intel, the institute has a really strong track record of industry collaboration, both locally and internationally. IVI runs webinars on a monthly basis, and you can keep up to date on these um, webinars through the IVI website and the LinkedIn page. This webinar is in conjunction with Empower, which is an eye on 10 million um, euro collaborative research program focused on the broad field of data governance. It is co-funded by, by Science Foundation Ireland and industry partners and brings together four world leading SFI centers, Lero, Adapt, Insight and Future Neuro, and it's coordinated by Professor Marcus Helfert in IVI. In addition to the many collaborative research projects that Empower are working on with industry and the public sector, in Empower they have also established a community of practice for just over a year. The community of practice brings together senior leaders from a diverse um, group of organizations right across industry, academia, public sector and society, where they're working collectively to create a data governance roadmap for Ireland which will have concrete recommendations and actions that will directly contribute to ensuring Ireland is a world leader in the data economy. Three specialist working groups have also been established as part of the community in practice, and in these um, areas of today's topic, open data and data sharing. Um, data value and standards in relation to data governance, which are co-led by researchers and practitioners. These working groups are focused on tangible outputs and deliverables based on the needs of the stakeholders across the community and look at three, six, nine, 12 month timeframes on what can be achieved. If you want to find out more about these working groups and get involved, please be sure to contact the Empower team. As mentioned earlier, today's topic, open data and data sharing, is well aligned with the Empower Community of Practice Specialist Working Groups, um, where those are delving deeper into uh, details that you may want to get involved in these, please reach out to Denise Manton in, in Empower. So open data, just a, as a little bit of background for anybody who's joining us that's not familiar with the topic. Um, open data refers to the concept of making data freely, data freely available, accessible and usable by anyone without restrictions on its use or redistribution. Its goal is to promote transparency, accountability and innovation by allowing individuals, organizations and governments to access and use data for a variety of purposes. Data sharing refers to the act of exchanging this data, um, and that can take many forms, including data sharing with organizations, between organizations are making data publicly available. Both open data and data sharing are important concepts that play a crucial role in promoting transparency, collaboration and innovation in various fields. And by making data more accessible and shareable, we can unlock new insights, drive innovation, and solve, hopefully, some of the world's most um, challenging um, problems. The benefits um, are well documented and, and um, uh, we also have a lot of challenges in this area. And I'm hoping today that our, pal our panelists will be able to tell us a lot more about um, some of these key issues. So before I introduce you to the panelists, I just want to give you an outline of how it's going to go. I'm going to um, introduce the panelists. I'm going to ask them for, for, I suppose, their opening opinion and thoughts on, on the topic. And then we're going to move to some questions and answers. I have some questions for the panel myself, but please feel free to pop some in the question box. Don't be shy. And we'll hopefully try and, and get to some of those as we move through. 
So our first panelist today is uh, Declan DC. Welcome, Declan. Um, Dr. Hey, everybody. Declan is an independent digital transformation and data strategy advisor. He spent over 30 years as a public servant in the European Commission, during which time he worked on the development of statistical and surveillance systems, information system architectures, methodologies, and interoperability frameworks. And he managed the central computing facilities of the EU Commission. As director, he led the definition of the Commission's overall strategy and information systems, including the development of corporate information systems, supporting administrative and policy processes. Since retiring from the EU as director for information systems and interoperability solutions, he has advised numerous international public bodies and governments on digital strategies, public sector digital transformation, national data ecosystems and data driven development. Declan has a first class honours degree in engineering and a PhD in computer science from Trinity College Dublin, where he was a research assistant and lecturer in computer science. Welcome Declan, thanks for joining us today. That's a, a strong CV. You've clearly been at the forefront of data strategy and planning for some time. Could we start with you? Could you uh, tell us what your position on open data and data sharing is and what you see as critical in this area? Yep. So thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, nice to hear all those nice things about myself. <laughs> um, and uh, I hope that uh, today's seminar will, our webinar will uh, generate some ideas and uh, actions for the various participants and that they will get some benefit from it. So um, it's been an interesting journey for me from a point where at, uh, in the 80s, when the first discussions took place around open data, in the European Commission, there was actually a position taken by many people that it should we should ask payment for access to public data. And that's how far things have evolved since then. And now you find that Eurostat and the Office Publications Office are major sources of open data across a whole range of, uh, of areas and that people can access freely uh, and uh, use to build their products. Uh, so it, this has been an interesting experience to see how data has moved to the center of people's reflections and preoccupations. And uh, particularly not just in the public sector, but uh, Increasingly, with uh, digital transformation strategies for, at a national level, uh, the participation of the private sector in uh, sharing data and in using data to uh, and reusing data to generate uh, value from their uh, digital products. So, this uh, idea of data as a public good, uh, you see this reflected now in all the actions around uh, data strategies at the European level. You have the European data strategy, where they advocate and are building now sector-specific data spaces, specifically for data sharing between academia, government, and business around health, uh, agriculture, finance, energy, public administration, and digital uh, scientific clouds. You see it also where the Commission has uh, adopted a digital decade 2030 with specific targets for data sharing in terms of skills, infrastructure, business and government. And the in European interoperability framework, which I was involved with at the beginning and is now going to be a cornerstone of the forthcoming Interoperability Act, all concentrate on creating uh, frameworks and sharing solutions at the semantic interoperability level so that people begin to share data and begin to use data, not just for uh, their own specific values, value chains, but to create value chains with partners. And uh, so two immediate messages from that type of uh, overview and that these data spaces, these common data spaces, people can participate in their collaborative creation. And funding is available because people should not uh, forget that the 
recovery and resilience facility at the level of Europe and at the level of Ireland is a major source of funding, particularly around skills. So there's actions and funding that can help people to move into the data sharing uh, domain. And I see this reflected with the work that I'm doing with the World Bank as well on a global level, where the World Bank in 2021 issued a report uh, Data for Better Lives, which had a long-term objective of creating a new social contract for data around value, trust, and equity. Trust in data, equity of access to data, and value derived from uh, sharing of data. So these are the, and all this brings to a position where data sharing is now understood at a political level as fundamental for the data economy. And that's why I think when we go to talk about the benefits and the challenges, we can see actions that are necessary to position ourselves well, because Ireland is rather well placed. It has a digital strategy based uh, around the digital decade, 2030, and it has a public sector uh, data policy built around the European interoperability framework. So lots of good things going on. And of course, we have to remember the game changer in terms of AI, where we have to begin to think about how uh, trustworthy data that's unbiased uh, is the source of these uh, AI products and transformation that we're going to be probably talking about later this afternoon. So that's a, an overview that I hope resonates with the viewers. Great. Thanks, Declan. Uh, I, I'm really fascinated by the, the, I suppose, the life cycle of that, that, that point from you talking, starting out by talking about paying for data to finally getting around to, to I suppose, where we're at now, we've we've come so far with with um, our, our our ethical views on how data should be used. To know that we've gone from thinking about paying for it to to now actually funding it and and supporting the the proper and ethical use of it. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Um. So next up we have Tara. So um, Tara Lee is a senior consultant at the Open Data Institute, uh, leading products projects in various sectors, including education, health, and physical activity media disinformation, net zero, smart data, and water. Her work supports corporate and non-profit organizations, governments, and academia. She joined the ODI in 2018 to lead the engagement for Open Active, a Sport England-funded initiative to help people um, more, become physically more physically active through open data. She now runs Innovation Challenges, supports organizations to write open data strategies, stewards data sharing advisory boards, and advises on community engagement with when opening data. The ODI is a nonprofit com company committed to promoting and uh, advancing trust in data, including open data, shared data, and closed to private data. Prior to joining the ODI, Tara was a senior consultant at Upshot, a project management, monitoring, and evaluation system. While she was there, she consulted on, uh, with and supported over 100 community organizations from across the UK to measure and demonstrate their impact. Hi Tara, it's great to have you to, with us today. Um, you. Your work on using data to empower communities is very forward thinking and inspiring. And again, I think it kind of echoes the, the, the how far we've come and the growth we've, come, we've had in our, our approach to data. Could you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on open data and data sharing and what you consider to be important to the area? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, as you said, I work for the Open Data Institute, which uh, no prize is for guessing how we feel about open data at the Open Data Institute. Um, however, we also recognize data sits on a spectrum from closed to shared to open, and it's not appropriate for all data to be made open or even for it to be made shared as well. So there's a number of things that need to be taken into consideration with data in terms of who should have access to that data, who could have access to that data, what are the risks in sharing it, what are the risks in not sharing it as well. And we've seen a number of examples over the past few years uh, where data that was previously not shared or 
it was there was a lot of blockers the infrastructure was not streamlined so it wasn't that easy to to share data where um due to different things you know covid is a is a really critical example of that where medical research data and health data it was made more easy to share and, and access that data to help speed up and accelerate the the process into developing vaccines as well as treatment and reaction plans across different countries as well so you can see in that situation making the data more easy to access and to share that data is, is really impo important but at the same time in that situation we're talking about health data we're talking about people's very personal data as well and so there have to be the right con controls and considerations in place before that data is shared or before that data is opened up to ensure that there is not harm falling on individuals, companies, communities, and wider society as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thanks for that. Um, I suppose that kind of echoes my own personal interest is in um, work in the area of health informatics. So that's a, a really um, important issues for me as well on that, that what you talk about data on the spectrum and, and knowing what to share and when to share it and with who, um, particularly with the personal um, sensitive data like health, health data. Um, and let, next and lastly, we're joined by uh, Patrick O'Sullivan. Um, Patrick is the Senior Director um, Business Inside Arlo Technologies, helping them to maintain their growth acceleration through data investments. Patrick's focus is to enable his internal customers to make the most of their data and show how data can be a strategic enabler for Arlo to become more data driven. He has over 25 years of international experience in the IT industry and is a strategic leader with strong business acumen. Patrick is a passionate um, customer advocate with deep industry knowledge and an interest in game-changing technology trends. A well-regarded IT evangelist and influencer, regularly presenting to the sea level and speaking at global industry events and conferences. Prior to joining Arlo, Patrick held uh, various leadership roles at Aer Lingus, Dell, EMC, GBA Software, Musgraves, and Patrick recently completed his executive MBA at UCC and holds a Bachelor of Commerce in Economics from University College Cork as well. Congratulations on, on completing the, the executive MBA, Patrick. Very impressive. Um, I suppose um, it's great to hear about your work um, as da data as a strategic enabler, so slightly different to, to, to what we've heard so far. But could you tell us what your thoughts on, on open data and data sharing and, and what do you think are, are pivotal, pivotal to the area? Yeah, th th thanks, Katie, and thanks for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, I suppose like uh, I'd echo kind of what Declan and Tara said around the value of open data and especially data sharing. I think T Tara's example of the of, of COVID, uh, kind of like between the pharma companies sharing their research to expedite the delivery of the vaccine and, and the treatment. I think that was obviously key to 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 kind of having a shortened time frame there. But for me, yeah, like I, I think open data can have a similar impact to let's say how some of the open source software like Apache and MySQL that kind of gave viable alternatives and now become mainstream. Like you, you think of a lot of the websites and kind of how they're how how they're built today. It's all kind of driven from that. The other aspect I'd look at though, and kind of just from my own not my own experience and probably from a lot of people on this call. I'm a big believer in open data internally in organizations because I've seen a lot of organizations where everything's siloed and data and information isn't always openly shared and understood across the organization. So not only about sharing data externally and making it open um, from an external perspective, but I think organizations and companies can do a better job of making data, open data kind of internally as well. So sharing across functions and making sure they're, they're not siloed. And then I think in, in the broader realm, I think like, by making sure we have accessible data, like, you know, we know from a government and organization perspective, they can harness the power of that data for greater good. But for us, it does help us hold our kind of public bodies and governments accountable on, on their promises and uh, on, on their service delivery. So looking forward to a good conversation today. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I suppose um we've we've had some some nice opening remarks there around, I suppose, the value of data, the the, I suppose data is sitting on a spectrum from from you know where it's appropriate to use it and when and I suppose a lot about the the the, the growth and the transformation of how we've approached data um over the last number of years and, and particularly at a strategic level 
So I suppose we've heard a little bit um, about some of the advantages um, and some of the, some, I suppose, some of the challenges around it. So I suppose just maybe um, specifically to, to look at those, um, maybe starting with the, the benefits. So I suppose Tara kind of mentioned, um, touched on one of those in, in terms of the, the health space, but um, maybe some of the other benefits of, of opening or sharing data um, at the appropriate time and place. Um, any thoughts? Anyone, do you want to jump in on that one? I mean, I can start off with okay. one example there. Um, so I think one of the key things I would say is around trust and transparency with opening data. Um, I mean, we're, we're seeing this, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the UK and we're seeing a lot of issues at the moment around trust with governments, with corporations, uh, with uh, you know, other companies and so on. And one of the key things that open data can do is, is help to promote transparency and accountability, um, which helps to enhance trust between organizations and the public. Um, obviously, if people are not doing the right things, then uh, the, you know, the trust is not necessarily going to be improved there. But for an organization that's trying to rebuild trust where it might have been lost or they they realize it's not something that they're doing very well on and they're considered quite closed and private as an organization rather than just their data by opening up more of their data and doing that in a safe and responsible way um they're giving that awareness to the public to their customers whoever it might be that they work with who their stakeholders are um and that helps to improve their own accountability um, because people are able to see what's going on there as well. Yeah, I think transparency is, is a key issue there as well. And I suppose the perception of transparency, whether they're actually, you know, I suppose we see that in, in some maybe some of the the social media companies, you know, well, like we, we, we perceive um, that the, there's a transparency there that maybe um, isn't always the case. So I suppose there's, there's a lot of factors to that. Um, would you have anything to, to add to that, Declan or Patrick, on the, on the benefits of opening or sharing data? Yeah. So uh, in the public sector, you see three targeted areas for benefits. First of all, a new generation of digital services that are data driven and provide access to trusted data services, which will be accessible to all. So transparent, uh, once only collection of data, uh, data that uh, is combined from different sources uh, to produce new digital services. So services is one area where there is value. And there I would pick up on what Patrick said, because if you look at large organizations and governments, what you see are silos, end of story. And they don't want to talk about sharing because they've built a complete stack. They probably have their own data center behind with their own data buried in legacy systems. <laughs> so there's huge effort needed to really produce services across a uh, uh, whole of government. The second area where there's benefits is in terms of the policies, evidence-based uh, policy making, fast, reliable access to relevant information across government services, where uh, there is an attempt to uh, use data from diverse sources, not only within the government service itself, but from, say, Eurostat or so, uh, international bodies, to produce better and more transparent policies, uh, ones that would be unbiased and ones which would use data aggregation techniques to make sure that uh, personal data was not uh, put in difficulty. Uh, because that, that whole area, I, and I come to trust under risks, because I don't want, I want to concentrate at this point more on, on the benefits. And the third benefit from uh, data sharing, of course, is you begin to talk about accessibility to data not just open data, but accessibility to the data that you have given the government services in terms of so that you've got uh, continuity of services, continuity of your data, rather than just having to reinvent it. Uh, and you begin to address the data divides that are visible in society because uh, COVID was a big success for the business and it, produced, it let people see what was happening in their data. But um, 
it's still a huge job to do to pro, uh, provide accessible data for people who are not necessarily experts in the area. And a final touch on accessibility, of course, is uh, it, open data and data sharing empowers civic society. It's not something we see very much in Ireland, but the Open Data Institute has done an awful lot of work in Eastern Europe. Uh, and if, for instance, in Ukraine, before the difficulties at the moment, on uh, empowering civic society to track down corruption through open data that's made available and mar merging it and identifying ways and means to uh, increase uh, digital democracy. So they would be the three the benefits that I would see coming out of this whole uh, exercise. Thanks, Declan. Do you have any um, benefits that that you do you want to add to that, Patrick, or do you, would you like to to speak to some of the risks and downsides of of which there are many? I'm sure. Yeah, no, maybe we we'll stick on the benefits for a while. I think like the big one for me is just the collaboration. When you see multi uh agencies kind of collaborating together like i, I read a, a recent blog there from the u.s state of virginia and kind of how they're tackling human trafficking and and the op the opioid problem like they've created a whole kind of data sharing system like so siloed federal data sets across law enforcement health bodies and social services and then using that data sharing framework to give a holistic picture of what's happening in the state and kind of giving them enough analysis around both the victims and the offenders and having the right demographics to make the right informed decisions. Um, and then I think like we see across countries, like just kind of collaborating on like, some of the, the larger kind of global challenges we have, the, the climate change, we, we've mentioned COVID and other health health, cri health crises. So from, from my perspective, kind of tr always try and bring it back to kind of data-driven decision-making, like so kind of, how much can that open data support making the right decision and making the most optimal decision? Like we make a lot of decisions today with our gut, uh, still in business, no matter how much data we have, you know, we've 20 years experience, I've done this every day, same as I've done yesterday. And you kind of, you, you get used to kind of making decisions, but you kind of have to look at it like, is that the right decision? Am I using the right data, whether it's from a data sharing or, or open data, and then just making sure then the organization, whether it's public or private, are basing those their decisions on kind of the evidence and insights, rather than that kind of gut, uh, that, that, that kind of gut, gut, gut decision making. And then I suppose the last piece, I think, from a data sharing perspective, you know, we now have these great data marketplaces. So whether for, for, on some of the cloud platforms, like you kind of got a Databricks have their own marketplace, uh, Snowflake have their own marketplace, and then you have things like Kaggle and data.gov and uh, each of the various different um, government organizations have their own kind of central spot where you know if you're looking for a certain, uh, certain amount of data, it's a great place for you to start, whether you're researching, whether you're looking at that from your company or your personal point of view, it's a, I won't say it's a one-stop shop, but it's a great place to start. I think that's a, a big benefit rather than having to go and, and search and try and find and collect data from uh, from different organizations and different locations. Yeah, thanks for that. I suppose we've, we've heard a lot there now about the uh, the benefits and, and then the, they're certainly clear. And, and when I suppose when what we're getting to the sense of, of data on that spectrum is when it's used responsibly and correctly, there, there's clear value to it on a societal level, on an economic basis. There, there's so much that, that we can do that's positive with data um, if we if we handle it with care. Um, and I suppose that's some of the risks and downsides and, and, and Tara mentioned around the, the transparency and I suppose the, the trust that, that that data will be handled properly um, and by the right people. But I suppose we have some risks and downsides when it isn't. Um, and maybe do you want to, to, to talk to that one, Tara, again? Yeah, sure. I mean, you, you've hit the nail on the head there, Katie. Um, open and shared data works really well when it's done responsibly. Um, when people do it without taking all of the considerations that they need to take, there are a number of risks that are at play there. Um, trust is a, is a key one there. There's, there's you know, there's leg, uh, legal and uh, regulatory risks. Uh, so, you know, you can potentially be breaking the law by sharing and opening certain data if you haven't considered those. Um, you know, you also need to think about if you have used other people's data in creating your own data sets, do you have the rights to then share those as open data? If that's licensed data, that's not 
openly licensed. Um, there are potentially, I mean, it, obviously it depends on the data that we're talking about here, but there are security risks in some cases in uh, opening up data. You know, it could jeopardize the security of people, of property, um, of infrastructure as well, whether that is physical or virtual. Um, those are relatively rare, but they're also incredibly high on impact. So those do need to be considered uh uh, you have to have sort of really good mitigations in place if you're going to be sharing or opening up any of that kind of data. Um, one of the big things that we talk about at the ODI is around ethical risks. So it may be that as an organization opening up this data, you're not breaking the law, you're not doing anything legally wrong in opening this data up. Um, but actually, you need to consider how uh, social uh, or personal influences might affect how that data was collected, how that data could be used, and the, the consequences of, of this when you're sharing the data. So, um, you know, could there be a lot of bias within that data? Um, I would argue that completely unbiased data is quite difficult. Um, and so a lot of the time we're talking about AI at the moment and the, the data that that AI is, is fed on. Um, getting to completely non-biased uh, AI, I think, is potentially not possible, uh, but we can reduce that bias quite significantly if we're, we're thinking about where that data has come from, um, who has or hasn't been included, what has or has not been included within that data. Um, you know, can using this data discriminate against groups or individuals? Uh, we see this a lot in the US with. Uh, data that is used on things like facial recognition, for example, in law enforcement. Um, you know, have people, have all of the relevant stakeholders' uh, thoughts, ideas, and considerations been brought into whether that data should be shared or not be shared? How do people feel about that data being shared? Um, could it harm the environment? If you open up where, uh, you know, rare species of animals, their their habitats are a very specific level. Are you making that really helpful and uh, useful for poachers, for example? Um, and you know if you're if you're thinking about individual or, or group privacy, welfare and safety, um, could that be impacted by decisions uh, being made with that data as well? Um, and then, I mean, there are also reputational risks. So we've talked about data quality. Um, you know, when you're publishing data, is it clear about the quality of that data? Obviously, in an ideal world, you're only publishing data that is of high quality. But in some cases, that's not feasible. And it's better to make a start publishing data that does need work. Are you making it clear when you publish that data? We know that there are some issues with this quality that need work. Um, you know, do you have good descriptions with that data? What is the metadata like there? Is it clear how that data was collected and what purpose it was collected for so that that data is not misinterpreted and then misused as a result when other people are then using that data? Um, you know, have you considered things like data standards uh, so that it makes it easier to understand the data and it makes it easier to combine it and compare it with other data sets? Um, and then I know there's, I think I saw a question in the Q&A earlier around public data versus commercial data. Um, from a commercial point of view, there are potentially commercial risks to, to publishing data. You know, if, you're, if your business model depends on confidential or, or trade secrets, then sharing those could be a risk to your financial sustainability. Um, on the other side of things, you know, thinking about uh, there's a risk if, of not sharing certain data as well. So you have to think about the balance there between the risk of sharing and the risk of not sharing. Um, and then there's also to think about costs as well. Uh, so starting on that uh, open data or that data sharing journey, uh, it requires time and resources to do that. And you need to think about how to make that sustainable as an organization as well. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose um the 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 trust and the the I suppose the security and and privacy and ethics ethical aspects are some things that I would come across a lot in in dealing with health data. Like the 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 benefits of sharing health data are you know are are well documented. 
for personalized medicine, the big, you know, access to big data that we have now using uh, secondary data for health um health research purposes, but there are so many challenges and, and risks around sharing that data, particularly because of the sensitive nature. And, and I suppose a lot of that are around regulation as well. And particularly if you're trying to share across countries. So things like having an all Ireland, you know, cancer registry, for example, and, and, and dealing with, with two different legislations. Now there's so many, so many challenges around that. And I suppose that regulation side of things, you know, how to actually regulate against the, the risks and downsides i suppose declan you've probably got a bit of, yeah. bit of experience on, on working on, on on how to i suppose how to minimize the risks in the, this area well i think what you've just mentioned there the the, the legal frameworks are are absolutely essential and uh, when you look at the interoperability framework you see technical semantic organizational and legal interoperability which is just what you, you you've touched on so th uh, that's particularly important when it comes to uh, trying to put together systems that allow uh, data to be shared cross border which of course is the whole objective of the of the single market but the points that Tara brought up I think are uh, extremely valid uh, in terms of preparing to sell the uh, idea of open data to at corporate level. If uh, corporate uh, level are preoccupied by the, protecting their data, not personal, but their commercial data, they're, they're concerned about their position vis-a-vis -vis their competitors, they're concerned about the legal implications if they uh, make data available that uh, they can be uh, considered counter to uh, GDPR. So all these issues are, are, are very important in preparing a uh, sort of a sales pitch for uh, an organization that's going to embark on uh, an open data journey. And, uh, but the whole question of trust in data is m even more important when it comes to services provided by uh, government. Because unless people uh, feel uh, at ease and are, can see how their data is being processed, uh, at government level, uh, the whole uh, issue of building more sophisticated services in the health area or in the uh, environmental area or, uh, is going to cause difficulties for people. So personal data, trustworthiness of personal data, uh, data protection in terms of if you are starting to collect data, how are you going to show people how that data is treated? How is that data stored? Where is it stored? Under what legal jurisdiction is it stored? Uh, what are the reuse uh, regulations regarding your personal data? Do you have any control over that? So all these issues uh, are going to become increasingly important. Uh, and then the, the risk of cybersecurity. We saw it with the HSE. I would uh, wonder how many other organizations have suffered similar uh, hacks and exfiltration of their data that we don't hear so much about. But, so the, uh, but we have heard enough for corporate level or in the organization to say, tell me how you're going to address the issues of cybersecurity if you're moving into a shared data environment with uh, people. The whole question of surveillance data. I mean that the digital single market, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act are both designed to create an environment of trustworthiness in Europe regarding how this data is, is used. Because surveillance and using the data that we have just without thinking made available across social media is something that's going to boomerang on us if we don't put in place the structures that are necessary to start to minimize the risk. Structures in terms of legal, uh, what Tara emphasized, and structures in terms of technical, in terms of uh, an increased and more resilient uh, infrastructure. And then the, the, the final risk that I would say is about our, a nas at national level, uh, if there are data leaks that provide access to the critical 
infrastructure that a country is dependent on, this is something that has to be raised uh, uh, at the highest level of government for, uh, the, from a societal point of view. Yeah, thanks, Declan. And I suppose the, those risks and, and downsides, you know, kind of are around addressing these trust concerns that, that people have, particularly you mentioned some, some very interesting examples there around the HSE and, and cyber, um, cyber crime. And I suppose some of the regulations around penalties for this, so penalties for, for misuse of, of data, um, we've seen a, a lot of that in the news recently, you know, some companies who who have, have misused data and have been penalized for that financially. But then again, the like the example of the HSE, somebody who's who's you know not not openly mis trying to do the best with their data and, and end up um having a, a cyber attack or something like that where the data is, is is now vulnerable. And I suppose it really on a societal level, I think makes people very um, unsure and concerned about sharing yes. the data. Um, and and it, it's really is trying to find that balance between what we understand and accept as the value of it, but, but um, letting people, giving people enough, I suppose, uh, safety nets to to show that yeah okay it is okay to to share your data with me that I'm gonna I'm gonna treat it re responsibly and and I'm gonna protect it um and I I'm not sure we're there yet in terms of of um feeling like our data is is being uh well looked after um are there are there other risks or challenges that that you see Patrick? No, I think t t t Tara nearly covered everything in uh, in her first go, and uh, I think Declan then kind of followed on with the from the the legal aspects. And I think on the legal side, certainly, I think the the new EU data and AI, AI acts that are going to come online in the next couple of years certainly will reinforce kind of what yep. we what we can do for us or what we from our own data perspective what we're sharing, but then kind of broader at the at the European level. I think maybe just to elaborate on one of Tara's points, just kind of around having the kind of clear metadata and kind of having the right yes. context yes. for data. Because you know the data sets there, but unless you know kind of why what it was gathered for, kind of what what, what the, the fields are referring to, what kind of filters or or, or what, what kind of uh what kind of how, how the questions were framed you could actually start using that data and misinterpret it the wrong way and then kind of give 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 out some uh, some wrong findings um the other aspect i think really is we haven't talked about yet is kind of the privacy of it so in a lot of cases a, a lot of the data sets you know the individual data sets might be anonymized so your personal details might be uh um M m m might be anonymized so it's it's okay in that data set but when that data set's combined with another data set you know there 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 could easily be links that can kind of, you can kind of potentially piece all that back together it might just be an email in one or an address in another and then suddenly you you might be able to piece the the full picture back together um and then i think the last thing around the challenge uh, we've seen the growth of chat gpt and, and and the large language models and kind of really from that perspective in terms of the data like who owns the content who owns the data uh, i think that's a that's a, a big decision that we have to kind of come and make sure we're prote we're protecting the the digital creators and and the and everyone who's providing the information and that they're getting the right credit and uh and it's being attributed back to them yeah, thanks, Patrick. And, and I like the, your point you, you made there about the, the anonymization of the data. And I suppose it echoes back to, to one of Tarek's points about data sitting on a spectrum at, um, at the start of the, yes. the webinar, um, that the privacy also sits on a spectrum. And I think maybe that's something that that some sometimes there can be a lack of awareness around the differences between anonymized data, pseudo-anonymized, de-identified. You know, the, there's, there's so many differences there that that I think unless you're working in the space, you might not necessarily be aware of, of, of those differences. And I suppose that is, to me as well, some of the challenges around, and that's coming to the next question around challenging challenges in opening data, is unless you're kind of a special, you know, an expert or specialized um working in this space on a on a regular basis there there's a lot to understand in the space you know and there's a lot of, around we've talked around the regulation we've talked around privacy data and and i suppose on the ethics and the trust kind of societal level is probably easier for people to 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 navigate but i suppose in terms of on one of the other questions that we'll, we'll come to in a moment is around um you know companies and organizations tackling these challenges but i suppose 
they have there are definitely challenges as well as risks to to opening that data up um and i, I suppose at an organizational technical and, and societal level we, we have a lot of uh, examples in those will i go to you again tara first <laughs> you can do um yes i mean there is a lot to consider when you're starting on this i would say I mean, and it's it's one of the reasons why the ODI exists as an organization, right? You know, we, we we campaign for more open data, we campaign for better policy, but we're also about helping organizations through the process with opening and sharing data and data governance and, and innovation and so on. Um, there are, for, that's not feasible for everyone. Not everyone can afford that kind of support. Not everyone has the resources to do that. I would say um, the open data journey, if that doesn't sound too cheesy, uh, is not an overnight process for an organization. It needs to be taken sort of step by step and consider all the different aspects of it. Um, you know, a lot of things, it, it, there is stuff available out there in terms of free resources. So, you know, if you want to, we have on our own website, we have an open data spectrum. So you can understand the differences between uh, closed, shared and open data. Uh, we have a... a a, a data ethics canvas so you can sort of take a data set and work it through this is all free resources by the way so anyone can go free and openly licensed resources we haven't talked about licensing but uh it might be getting a little bit too technical on on this particular uh talk there um so there are a lot of different free resources out there um so i would you know you could use chat GBT, frankly, to say, what do I need to think about when I'm opening up my data? And the checklist is probably going to be quite uh, quite accurate there and, and all encompassing. Um, there will be certain things you will need special sort of expert advice on as an organization, thinking about the legal risks of opening up data. You do need legal uh, advice and guidance on that. So anyone who's not... Um, part of a, a law firm or anything like that are not going to provide legal advice because they're not going to be liable for that. Um, if you're sort of um, public organization and you're looking at sort of government regulation things, government should be providing that guidance and so on, I think. Uh, obviously that will depend on sort of country to country around what is available and what's not available and, and different organizations always making improvements in that area. But what I would say in summary is there's a lot of resources out there to look at do not assume this is an overnight job or a one month project. It is not. Uh, it needs to, you need to think about it as a new thing for it to become business as usual. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, Declan, you, you were yes. going to jump in there. I'm, you, you probably saw me nodding my head there with what Tara was saying. It's a long journey and it's a hard journey. And uh, the it's uh, often a journey uh, that's in, uh, not necessarily recognized by uh, the organization and given the necessity. I've seen it in many organizations I've seen and one of the one of the countries that I'm working at at the moment is Moldova where they had a big initiative on open data in 2010 2012 with the structures in place CDOs across government sectors and so on but uh, gradually over time it faded away and now has to be rejuvenated. But uh, in terms of the challenges, uh, I think you're right to say that there's a lot of challenges around uh, the, the fundamental issues associated with the data sharing journey. Uh, and Patrick mentioned it earlier as well, uh, the cultural change that's necessary. Mm. So data sharing and collaborative working methods are not necessarily the working methods that are <laughs> common in uh, uh, large organizations, SMEs and government, obviously. Um, so, and uh, priority given to metadata, again, is something that uh, unless there's a, an understanding that this is important and its fundamental role can be neglected. Uh, where are you on your journey? What is the data maturity model that you're using? Are the fundamentals in place? Unless the fundamentals are in place, you're not going to move to free flow of data and you're not going to optimize the system. So they have to start thinking about data maturity models for your organization. You have to start thinking about data governance uh, uh, and uh, you know, 
three interdependent layers in terms of strategy, in terms of legal and institutions, and in terms of technical, particularly around standards and interoperability. You have to start thinking about new delivery uh, paradigms if you're going to be building these systems where you give design by uh, design for interoperability, design for security, uh, open by default, digital by default. These are paradigm shifts in the methodologies being used in organizations for developing their systems. Uh, the once only principle being applied so that you begin to use data once you give it once it's used many times with all the implications that that has in terms of uh, protection of data uh, skills digital and data savvy human capital in your organization and finally and unfortunately the elephant in the room legacy systems <laughs> Legacy systems were not designed to share data. They're probably running on proprietary software. They're probably running in prior, uh, proprietary data centers. And they are jealously protected by those who uh, have uh, invested their time and energy in building them. So collaborative working methods is an easy phrase, but it runs into a brick wall when it comes to taking the decisions to replace or adapt legacy systems. So this is, uh, these are the challenges and uh, without leadership, it's going to be very hard to uh, identify the actions and drive the actions through so that the journey continues rather than hitting a brick wall. You, you've, you've hit a, a keynote for me there, Declan, with the, the proprietary systems and the legacy systems. One of the biggest, biggest challenges we have in, in sharing healthcare data um, uh, particularly around proprietary systems and the, the lack of standardization, which yeah. uh, obviously uh, leads to a, a failure in interoperability. Um, anything to, to add on, on those challenges and, and how companies could, could prepare for them, Patrick? Oh, we've... Uh, Patrick's on mute. You're back. Yeah, mute? sorry, that yeah. was on mute there. But yeah, just to, to echo, like it's not it's not something you can kind of just put data out there and uh, they will come. You kind of really have to think about in the long term, not only from an infrastructure perspective, but from a resourcing side as well. You, you want to make sure that the data is kept up to date. You want to make sure it's kept secure, that it that it, it's relevant to, uh, to to the answer to the questions that it, it might be trying to answer. I think then kind of from what, what, what Declan said, governance is key as well. Like, you know, you have to have the right quality on that data. You want to be protecting any sensitive data. You want to understand how mature that data. And then I think the other thing that I don't think has quite been touched on yet is, especially for data sharing agreements, like anytime we're sharing data uh, with the, with various third parties, you know, we have to have our legal team involved. We have to make yeah. sure there's a, a full data risk assessment done, like, understanding kind of what they're doing with that data, where they're storing it, uh, and uh, what, what country that could be, but how they're actually storing it, how it's being secured, and then ultimately how that's being used. And then when you think from a life cycle perspective, like kind of, okay, are they using it for, sorry, are, are they deleting it after the, 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 the relevant time period, whether like a year or two years, seven years, whatever that is, baked into the agreement and you know you kind of have to keep an eye on those third party um vendors and making sure that they're keeping up their side of the bargain as well so like the minute you sh start sharing you you, you have to st then start making sure that somebody's kind of just holding people accountable to that to, to say that they're uh, they're using it in the way that they said they would yeah definitely um and, and i think around that that whole um the um the i suppose the structure and the standards around the data as well the data quality that you mentioned there i mean like it's one thing having the quality of governance around it and, and protecting it but i suppose we haven't really touched much on the quality of the data itself and to, to ensure that's something that companies would have to put a, a lot of time and, and money and effort into as well to ensure that the data that they are collecting is of high quality um, and that that quality is maintained, um, uh, touching on Declan's point again, that you don't just, you know, set it up and and, and hope that it'll, uh, like you said, uh, that, that you just hope for the best, that once you put the initial effort in, that that it has to be maintained. Um, 
I think we've touched on a lot of really interesting points there. The last kind of two questions kind of became one in the end, but um, we have a lot of questions here um, from the audience in the Q&A. So I'm just gonna have a look at some of those. Um, one of the first questions there we had, is there a greater urgency in the public sector to move towards an open data approach? COVID being an example where open data, data sharing was accelerated, greater good being the benefit. Are industry a bit more cautious to share data? Any thoughts on that one? Maybe who? Maybe Patrick, do you have any thoughts on that? Or industry more cautious? Yeah, I, 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 I would think so. I think certainly from a public sector, kind of as a Declan outline, like there is data strategy, like from, from an Irish government perspective, similar in the UK, sim, similar across, across the, the, the European government as well. I think very much the transparency uh, the, the governments are, are looking to do that as much as possible. Again, people want to see that they're getting value for money. They want to see kind of how their data is being used. So I think there is definitely th that urgency on the public sector side. I think certainly, yes, uh, industry is more cautious, I think, because mm -hmm. at times you have to protect your, your, your intellectual uh, capital. You kind of have to protect your IP by sharing some of that data, are you sharing some of your kind of secret sauce in terms of uh, of kind of how your company is has a competitive advantage in the market? So definitely industry is more cautious. I think there are certain good use cases around that, that industry is coming to kind of coming more to the table to share their data. But even when they're sharing, there's still a kind of either, it's a small kind of closed shop of, um, of companies that are sharing, uh, or it's it's not quite the full data set that they're kind of let, let, letting out. So I think industry definitely does have a lot more to go to kind of catch up to the to the transparency that the public sector is bringing. Yeah, we have. A, okay, I was going to actually come to you next, Tara, because there's a linked question that that maybe you could touch on on answering that, but also um another um. Attendee asks, is the legal side a major barrier for SMEs? Are they more likely to, to not have this resource in-house? So you touched on that earlier. And I suppose yeah. just again a bit on the the kind of the, the industry being more cautious. Mm. Yeah, so I think um there's a lot of getting the process started. So we talked about, we we touched on the fact that that culture is a really important aspect to opening up data. Um and building that data culture to start sharing, start opening up that data is, is probably, I would actually say that is the biggest challenge uh, because that can, you know, even if you've got all the right systems in place, even if you've got all the right processes in place and all the legal frameworks and things, we're actually getting to that stage. If you haven't got the culture uh, built into the organization, you haven't been working on that, people will become blockers because that's people don't like change. Um, and so that is a, a key aspect to think about in terms of the difference between sort of public sector and, and corporations. I mean, I think there is a, a greater expectation from people for the public sector to open up more of their data. Um, you know, you are a public body, you are for the people, you are for, you know, that. So there is an expectation there that you should be doing all that you um, can to do that for larger corporations um you know if you've got I've, I've, i don't think i've ever met an organization where they've got a, a corporate uh, sorry a, a commercial arm where the commercial people when we've gone through a risk assessment hasn't said oh well we don't currently do anything with this data to make any money but we could do in the future mm. and the thing i'll say back to them is well what how long have you been collecting this data how long have you not been doing anything with this data? What are the risks of not opening up this data that you're you're holding on to? So there's that kind of data hoarding, data fearing um, thing to think about. In terms of the legal aspect, um, it's I think it's a very important one. I mean, it depends on the the type of data we're talking about. You know, here we're talking very in very general terms. Um, it really depends on the type of data that you're talking about as to the the size of the part to play legal has within that open data process. Um, there should be other people within your organization who will know different things about that data. So you'll want data owners, for example, who's responsible, who knows the most about that data and will be able to flag some of the dangers and risks 
Um, so, you know, that data, if, com if compiled with some other data that's already out there, is going to risk re-identifying individual people or causing uh, environmental risks and so on. Um, your technical team will be able to, to help you talk about the actual feasibility of getting the data out there and, and what needs to happen to that data set. I would say in terms of data quality, I really am reluctant to say data needs to be perfect before it is put out. It's okay to put data out that is not perfect as long as you flag that that is the case. Uh, and you say, we know this data is not perfect and we know there are some issues with it and either these can be fixed, but it's gonna take us time to do it. So in the meantime, we're still giving you the benefit of accessing that data now, but it, we, you know, we think it's gonna improve over time. I mean, in some cases, you'll have uh, public feeding back to you and helping you to find issues and errors with the data and helping you to actually improve that data quality, uh, which would have been more difficult to do yourselves. Um, the other thing is also being really clear about, you know, why there might be gaps in the data. So um, I've been working with a lot of water companies recently in, in England, uh, and they worry about, well, you know, our, our river monitors sometimes they break because they're quite fragile. And so if we have gaps in the data, public think we're hiding something. It's like, no, you're not hiding anything. <laughs> the data's not there because the sensor broke. Um, so that needs to be really clear when they're publishing the data and the metadata explaining that these things are fragile, they break this often, uh, this one's currently broken, it'll be fixed in X month's time or X week's time, whatever it might be. Uh, so there's a lot of communication that needs to go on there. Uh, I think, I mean, there was a lot of questions that I was trying to tackle all at once there. I'm not sure if I've covered all of them off, but. I, I think you have, and I could, it's touched on another one of the, the questions from the, the audience. Um, somebody asks, who do I need? There's quite a bit around what I need, but how do organiza organizations address the who and skills gap? So I think what you were describing there, even with the the, the water companies, you know, they, they, they have these issues, but they don't necessarily know who they can go to, to, to help solve this or where that skills gap is. So obviously if, if everybody had a tower that they could just uh, to bring up, but I suppose on a, on a more local level, you know, what can companies do? Who can they reach out to, to try and get more information on this and, and, and try and make the, the navigating this path a little easier. So I, I would say that's need to go back to the data, general data governance yes. within the organization. Yeah. Um, who who needs to be involved in your full data governance life cycle. Um, and in all likelihood, those are the same people that need to be involved in your open data process. You will yeah. need to think about top level senior buy-in. You will need to think about um, sort of lower grassroots level um, support as well. The people who are actually going to be doing most of the work. Um, the people who are going to be publishing the data, the people that are responsible for collecting and maintaining the data um and then you will have your communications uh people as well because communication as you're publishing data and as it's being maintained and managed is really important having those feedback loops there is really important um legal we've talked about as well uh i don't know Declan patrick if i missed anyone out there no, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, capacity building in an organization is fundamental and uh, not necessarily uh, bringing in new people, but training people who are already in responsible positions around data. And you can start on, a, on, on a, with some very simple uh, steps, which uh, will generate a lot of interest and questions, like develop a data inventory. What data do you actually have? And if you've got uh, embryo CDOs across your organization, these are the people who will be able to answer that question. And then you can move to data classification. Is it personal data? Is it non-personal data? Is it big data coming from uh, data collection through of sensors? Or is it already open data? There may be in and So all the, they're the simple things to start before you begin to put in place a data strategy or as, elements of a data strategy which but uh, identifying people in the organization that are not necessarily technical there's people who are data oriented rather than technically oriented would be is is particularly important and then building up through the leadership up to uh, leadership and sponsorship uh, is is also uh, fundamental 
Want uh, um, yeah. Do you want to add anything anything to that, Patrick? Uh, no, I, I think we covered. It. I, I really could maybe re reiterate on uh, on Tara's point. I think that feedback loop in, like, uh, but when you're releasing data out there, I think uh, yes. it, it is. You don't have to make sure it's like polished to the nth de nth degree. Like, you're never going to get a data set that's 100% pristine. Uh, any of these large data sets that you're going to share, you kind of have to put in the caveats in there. You have to bake in the assumptions or, or the known errors. And then it, it nearly ends up being kind of like crowdsourcing in terms of your, your data quality is, is kind of enhanced through uh, the more eyes that are looking at it, the more that it, it actually improves and the more kind of gaps that you can see. But I think having that feedback loop from the consumers of the data back to the back to where I was providing the data, I think that's very important. And then having the right communication out to say, you know, these are, these are, this is how we built the data. This is the, the context and we're using it. And these are the known gaps. And in some cases it might be, we just don't know what we don't know. And then hopefully the more it's consumed, the more then that feedback loop will come in and, and improve that data and ultimately enhance that, enhance that data as well. Mm -hmm. It's one of the big benefits of opening up data. Um, but also, you know, if you don't have the, that communication in place, there's yeah. often a question mark, how are you actually going to track the benefit of what you've done and the impact of what you've done? So having that communication plan in place on the, the release and management of data that's been opened up is, is, is critical. There is some good news. There is some good news at the European level where you begin to see uh, a lot of initiatives around these common data spaces and around the interoperable Europe uh, initiative. So that, uh, and then there's the EU legislation. All of these create a, a context within which organizations can see how to, what, what they can bring into their organizations to make it more easy to develop uh, data platforms. So th there's a lot of good news at the European level. And in Ireland, there's also the embryo of what uh, the World Bank calls the integrated uh, national data ecosystem, where business and government come together around uh, data sharing and around uh, data value, specifically identifying the need to have institutions, laws, data infrastructure, economic policies, which are particularly important in an Irish context, and human capital. So these five uh, elements coming together and driven by the government through leadership can put in place uh, an overall ecosystem where SMEs can see their role and where a private sector can also see their role in terms of uh, using the data. And the leadership issue uh, I think is, is is particularly important. And I was highly uh, amused last week at the, the SEMIC conference in Madrid, where the closing speech was given by Madame Calvino, who is the uh, first uh, vice prime minister of Spain, responsible for economic, uh, for the economy and digital transformation. And she zoomed straight down and said, without standards and without interoperability, we are not going to succeed, which is a rather interesting thing for somebody at that level uh, in the government to uh, pass as the message that uh, standards and interoperability are the baseline on which to begin to build a data sharing economy and a data driven uh, society. I certainly echo that one. It's uh, in, 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 interesting, as you say, to hear it to come, coming from somebody at that level. Um, yeah. And I suppose just on the regulation side, we have another question um, from the audience, um, probably probably initially directed to you, Declan. Is there a gap between the various acts coming down the line versus clear operational guidelines for organisations? Uh, well, the main operational guidelines for organizations will come through the Interoperability Act. 
which is currently uh, working its way through the, the system. It's uh, and it should be approved uh, first quarter of next year. Uh, and it uh, identifies governance. It's, it's first of all, it's an act. So it's legally binding on countries to start thinking about what governance is being put in place. And it talks about uh, trust uh, assessments of how along the data maturity it's going, people are uh, going. And it talks about the sharing and reuse of solutions which is also key from an economic point of view and from having standardized approaches and it uh, identifies support measures. So this will, be the one, this will be the one to watch out for in terms of impact on your organization. The, uh, the data markets uh, is to help citizens in terms of quality of data and protection of their data. And the data services is really the very large platforms and how they are abusing their position and preventing other organizations getting uh, a small startups getting into into the game. But uh, so they would they're the three ones to look at. But the one to wait for really is the Interoperability Act next year. Hopefully it'll solve a lot of our, our, our problems. Oh, and, and Well, solving problems. <laughs> well, it, it might, yeah. might make the journey a little easier. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I, th I think we've touched on most of the audience questions bar one. There's one one that hasn't. Um, we have had some extra questions that I think we've answered in, in, in our discussion here. But we have one left that's on the life cycle of data. So yes. opt out of sharing it in the future. How can this be practically managed for people who have shared data what about in 10 years time? So that's a, it's a, a, a bit of a Pandora's box one and it kind of comes back and again, touches on the legacy system. So, so if, if, I, if I opt into sharing my data now and, and, and we'll say maybe a man, like the trust example, if I give my data to some company now and, and there's some, some trust scandal about them down the line, where does that leave me then? So we're, we're, what, how do we feel about that life cycle of the data and, and you kind of agreeing once and you're, you're trapped in, in the cycle. Uh, well, I think GDPR tackles that to quite a great extent. We have the right to be forgotten within yeah. within data that's been collected about you. So, um, I mean, essentially if organizations are doing their data collection and their data management and their data deletion properly, um, there, shouldn't, there shouldn't really be an issue there. Um, there are obviously, you know, reasonable restrictions on that. If your collect, if your data is collected as part of a large statistic, and individual data on you is not um, kept and included, but you're part of a wider number, if you like, an aggregated figure, uh, it's not going to be possible for someone to delete your your number from that because they won't be able to identify you as an individual there. Um, but you're not an individual, so that shouldn't be an issue. Um, but essentially, GDPR should be holding these organisations to account. Well, GDPR, not mm -hmm. <laughs> those those who are uh, sort of monitoring GDPR of organisations. Uh, you know that keeps these organisations accountable for the most part. I would say. Well, it's the part of the life cycle that people don't think about very much, the preservation of data and the archiving of data and making it available in the long term. So I think the person who posed the question has put his finger or her finger on uh, a particular issue, uh, because uh, if we move into a purely digital world, there has to be uh, both technical and legal uh, frameworks in place to ensure that the data remains available. Uh, and, you know, you see that uh, I, I saw that I used to say from 1980 to 2020, there was a big gap in terms of preservation of data in organizations. Now things are better because it, we, we have moved to a predominantly digital world. But nevertheless, it's it, it, it's an issue that has to be addressed. And just to make you feel uh, worried about it, you know, uh, John Nocton, the professor in, uh, in Oxford, he uh, has a blog where he, he's uh, he, he, digital technology and its impact on society is his driving force. But he always, his hobby is photography. And regularly, he says, and don't forget, 
if you really want to have your photographs in 20 years time, don't forget to put them into a shoebox. <laughs> don't rely on <laughs> having them available through the cloud. So it, it is a preservation of data and long term. So long term sustainability of the solutions is key to trustworthiness. It all mm. comes back to that. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point as well. I, I sit on a number of research um, ethics committees in, in the university and in various universities along the way. I'm always surprised by when when we give people ethics forms to, to complete for, for their research. And they're always shocked when we say things like, you know, your data needs to be stored securely in an anonymized format for seven years. Um and that, you know, access needs to be limited. And people are like, seven years? Oh, that's such a long time. They always seem to, to be surprised by that. But I think actually something, if these kind of research ethics committees, particularly even at an undergraduate level, they, they force people to learn a lot more about this topic now than, than, the, than you might not um, come across in, in, in other settings. And it's good to, to ensure, you know, to, to obviously have some governance over that as well and make sure that things are being done, as we've been saying, in a trustworthy and an ethical manner. Um, I think we've covered all the questions. Are there any other points, any final closing comments or things that you, you think we mightn't have, have covered that anybody wants to add? No, I, I don't add, think it's been... Oh, sorry, Dr. Sorry. Yeah, I would add two points, which are uh, we haven't gone into much detail on them, but they are nevertheless interesting, uh, I think, to uh, as takeaways. First of all, uh, Ireland is particularly well placed in terms of uh, common cross-border data spaces. I think we mentioned that uh, the different uh, health regimes, I think. Uh, so, and in the context of common data spaces and interoperable Europe, I think Ireland has a role to play that would be of interest. And we can come back to that in terms of uh, work packages uh, for the, the different working groups that would emphasize the uh, potential of Ireland to play a major role. The second point that I would think we didn't talk too much about uh, was AI for SMEs, which is a, a very important point from my point of view uh, in terms of making a, because AI may be the sales pitch to attract corporate attention. There's so much talk about it. And from that, you can build uh, a business case that the skills that are required and the data that's required and the capacity building and the data literacy in your organization can uh, it can uh, put together a, an attractive uh, business model to uh, convince uh, corporate management and that the moment has come to really tackle the legacy systems and the silo mentalities that they have probably in their organizations. So that would be the last one. Anybody else, anything else to add? I think it was a, a, that was a, a, a good closing summary there, Declan, in itself. Um, but I suppose just to kind of touch on some of the things that we talked about. So, so data sharing, as we've seen, and we've discussed has several advantages, including promoting transparency, preventing corruption, increasing public trust, um, we've seen that it has the uh, potential to improve strategic alignment and decision making processes. It can boost productivity, encourage collaboration and, and innovation and enhance data quality. And we've heard that it can contribute to um, addressing social and environmental challenges on the way to a hopefully more sustainable world. Uh, I think we can agree um, from, from what we talked about today that in today's hyper connected data driven landscape, um, data is und undeniably the lifeblood of, of modern business. Um, and in recent years, governments and organizations have made their data more accessible to the public and open data and data sharing has certainly become a hot topic. And we've heard lots on um, um, lots of inf informative points on that today. Uh, sharing the valuable uh, resource has untapped potential for collaboration and, and innovation. But as we've discussed about the risks and challenges today, it's not without its complexities. Organizations have potentially um, vast data sets and, and, and data seeds to navigate, and they'll in inevitably face specific challenges that, would, that may impede or propel their journey along the way. Um, it's been fascinating to hear everybody's perspectives on open data and data sharing today. I'd really like to thank all the panelists for taking their time to, to share their thoughts and insights on this pivotal topic today. 
Um, thank you very much for joining us, um, everybody in the audience. And um, I hope that you have learned something um, very important about data sharing. Oh, we have one more. Yeah, well, go ahead, Declan. So the final message, data matters. And leveraging data for sustainable prosperity is the challenge we all face together. I think that's a, an, an excellent closing slide. I'm just going to um, move to my, my presenter mode doesn't want it to work for me. Apologies. Just while you're figuring that one out, Katie, I think it's worth saying. There we saying. go. <laughs> go ahead, Tara. I was going to say we've we I think we talked about the benefits in quite a brief uh, overarching way at the beginning, but there are thousands of examples and case studies out there of the benefits that can be gleaned from opening and sharing data. So um, what I don't want is people to come away from this feeling super overwhelmed or feeling like the cons are, are definitely outweighing the pros because in all likelihood they're not. Um, try to think about it as a as a longer term journey rather than as a very very steep mountain to climb and actually a lot of the work that needs to go into opening up data or sharing data even if you didn't open up a single data set will probably help your organization on exactly. its own in terms of processes efficiencies learning uh growth etc so um think about it as one step at a time rather than a huge mountain that needs to be climbed overnight Definitely. A w wise words to close up there. Um, just um, for, for everybody else's future information, if you want to learn more about these future webinars um, or learn more about IVI, you can sign up to the newsletter or contact um, us at info at IVI to su subscribe. They're also on um, X and LinkedIn. Um, and the next IVI webinar series is Standards, Navigating the Current and Future Landscape. And that's on the 23rd of November at 3 p.m. again. So hopefully some of us, uh, some of you will be able to join us for that again. Thank you all again for your time this afternoon. And um, I hope you have a, a, a fruitful and easy data sharing experiences after today's talk. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.